morning, everyone. Welcome to the first plenary session of the course by Dr. Michael Munger. He's Professor of Political Science, Economics, and Public Policy at Duke University. Professor Munger is a prolific author with more than 200 articles and papers published in professional journals and eight volumes, as well as seven books. Much of his recent work has been in philosophy, examining the concept of truly voluntary exchange, a concept for which he coined the term EO voluntary. His newest book addresses the sharing economy and it's entitled Tomorrow 3.0. So welcome, Dr. Michael Munger. Please go ahead. Well, thank you very much. It is a pleasure. Um, and I'm going to use a PowerPoint, which I have shared. Anyone who's interested in that, because I'm going to go pretty quickly. Uh, anyone who's interested in that is free to uh, ask for it from Fernando. Uh, and I wanted to start with the, the TLDR. So if the rest of it's just too long and you, you're not going to read it, here is the basic argument that I want to make in favor of commercial society. Now, there's a number of arguments against. There's a number of qualifications for this argument. You're going to hear them in later sessions of this seminar series. But I wanted to start with the full-throated argument in favor of capitalism. And to get there, we have to build up. So at the most basic level, the argument for commerce is based on exchange relations. In a voluntary exchange, both parties to the exchange are better off. And that fact alone, I think we often lose sight of. We have a lot of stuff. It's in the wrong place. So if we allow exchange, if we allow people voluntarily to engage in what Adam Smith called the propensity to truck, barter, and exchange, stuff moves towards higher valued uses. No one has to direct it. Everyone's acting just in their own self-interest. Now, the voluntary part is doing a lot of work there. And as Fernando said, it is important that it be voluntary. And I've tried to problematize what voluntariness is with my work on you voluntary exchange. If you're interested, you can look at that. But the way to think about exchange relations is this. Anytime we agree on a price, it must be true that we disagree about the value. Anytime we agree on a price, it must be true that we disagree about the value. So economics with its modern focus on equilibrium prices makes it seem as if everyone agrees. That's not true. If I sell you a car for $1,000, that must mean I value the car less than 1,000 and you value the car more than 1,000. We're both better off by exchanging the car for $1,000. So in any voluntary exchange, both parties are made better off. The public policy implication is the more of these voluntary exchanges that take place, the better. Now, the second stage in terms of concentric circles is market society. Markets are the set of institutions that reduce the transaction cost of impersonal exchange. That is, I don't have to know a lot about your family background. I, we don't have to engage in repeat business. This can be a one-off transaction, and we can exchange and both be made better off. Now, those institutions that constitute market society are a kind of set of preconditions for the emergence of commerce. The way that those work is we need some sort of currency. We need some sort of system for adjudicating disputes over breach of contract. We need a police system for enforcing property rights. And we need a, a, a system of government where property rights are defined and uh, are protected by law. So if, if we have those things, then we can have a market society. And the essential thing about market society is the development of division of labor. So the thing that I think is not often enough talked about, the dynamic force behind market society is division of labor. So where for exchanges, the, the dynamic part is both parties to a voluntary exchange are better off. So voluntariness is the essential feature. For market society, division of labor is the essential feature. That brings us to the third and smallest of the concentric circles. So you could have a system that's based on exchange, you could have a system that's based on markets, but those wouldn't be a capitalist society. A capitalist society, the argument for capitalism is essentially one thing, one word, liquidity. Liquidity is the ability of financial institutions to direct as yet unformed capital 
toward unrealized profit opportunities. And I'm going to talk a bit more about profit opportunities in a moment, but liquidity is a way of raising as yet unformed capital. It's not a building. It's not a forklift. It is liquid in the sense that it can be formed into almost anything that an entrepreneur can imagine. And then the entrepreneur takes the chance of trying to use that capital in order to secure profits. So <clears throat> the way that commercial capitalism works is this. I go out and I'm an entrepreneur and I make... I enter into, I negotiate a set of voluntary contracts. These voluntary contracts involve me making you an offer for plastic, for electricity, for metal, for labor, for building space, for retail space. I have to, I enter into all of these input market contracts that are voluntary because you're not obliged to sell me this. You only sell me these inputs if that is the best use for your input in terms of you being receiving the, ma the maximum payment for it. I, the, the entrepreneur, I then take these inputs and I combine them in ways that I have thought of, in ways that I hope will attract consumers. I then go to the output market and I try to sell this product that I have made in retail markets. And consumers only buy it if they are made better off. Consumers don't have to buy my product. If they buy my product, they must think that they are be made better off as a consequence. There is a total amount of revenue that I get from selling my product in this output market, all voluntary contracts, I take that revenue and I use it to pay off my input suppliers, or I use it to pay off the loan that I use to get liquidity so that I can uh, buy all the inputs. So I'm comparing the amount of revenue that I get from all of these voluntary exchanges and output markets to the amount of cost that I have with all of these voluntary exchanges and input markets. And I have to stop there for a second. Look at all of the people I've already made better off. I have improved the lives of all the input suppliers because all of those exchanges were voluntary. I have improved the lives of all of the output purchasers because all of those exchanges were voluntary. Now, though, comes the moment of truth. I take the amount of revenue that I have secured and I compare it to my costs. If my revenues exceed my costs, that's a particular high-powered price, which economists and uh finance people call profits. Profit is a particular kind of price that gives an indication about the social value of this activity. If, if profits are positive, it means that not only is this a good activity, but we should do more of it. If profits are negative, if I'm incurring losses, it means this is not a socially valuable activity. I, I should either do less of it or none at all. And so we have a, a system that tells us about the use of resources. We have a, a price system that comes from markets that tells the, the value of resources and capitalism that tells us about the overall value of the activity. These are all based on exchange relations. Now, there are some systems that are markets, but not capitalist. China, for the most part, for example, is not truly a capitalist system. They're actually capital constrained because for the most part, those the, their capital comes from forced saving. They don't really have advanced financial markets, but they do have a market society in which prices, for the most part, guide division of labor. So that's the, the TLDR version. Now let's go back and talk about the most important concept that I've tried to discuss, and that is what is economics and how does division of labor work? So Lionel Robbins famously said, economics is the science that studies human behavior as a relationship between ends and scarce means. And that's why we use in economics classes constrained optimization. We have a limited amount of resources. We're trying to devote it to its highest valued use. Well, I don't think that's actually the correct definition of economics. Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations defined political economy as a branch of the science of a statesman or legislature, legislator with two distinct objects. First, to provide a plentiful revenue or subsistence for the people, or more properly, to enable them to provide such a revenue or subsistence for themselves. And secondly, 
to supply the state or commonwealth with a revenue sufficient for public services. It proposes to enrich both the people and the sovereign. So the claim is that Smith is making in Wealth of Nations is that commerce, because it gives us a way to elaborate division of labor, enriches both the people and the sovereign. Now, the first economist, arguably, was the Greek poet Hesiod, who wrote Works and Days, and I include this partly because it's hilarious. This was more pre-Robbins than pre-Smith, because he was worried about scarcity. So uh, Hesiod describes this farmer. He settled down near Helicon in a settlement afflicted with human woes, Ascara by name. It is a place that's bad in the wintertime, difficult in the summertime. It's a place that's never really good. So you can see why the problem of scarcity in a place that's never really good means that you have to be careful about how you allocate your resources. So the, the scarcity is an important part of thinking about markets, but division of labor is a way out of scarcity. So the Ever since then, and with Xenophon 350 years ago, uh, Xenophon said, for just as all other arts are developed to superior excellence in large cities, in that same way, the food at the king's palace is also elaborately prepared with superior excellence. In small towns, the same workman makes chairs and doors and plows and tables. Often this same artisan builds houses, and he's thankful if he can find employment enough to support him. But in large cities, Inasmuch as many people have demands to make upon each branch of industry, one trade alone, and very often even less than a whole trade, is enough to support a man. One man, for instance, makes shoes for men, another for women. There are places even where one man earns a living by only stitching shoes, another by cutting them out, another by sewing the uppers together. So this is actually, in 350 BC, this is a precursor of what later became Adam Smith's pin factory example. So it follows, therefore, as a matter of course, that he who devotes himself to a very highly specialized line of work is bound to do it in the best possible manner. So there's two things to note there. The first is that the amount and the quality of production is much higher under, under division of labor. The amount and quality of production is the definition of wealth. Wealth is not money. Thinking that wealth is money or gold is the Midas fallacy. It was the mercantilist fallacy that Adam Smith was arguing against. Now, wealth is not the only thing that matters in our lives, but the people who think wealth doesn't matter probably have some. For poor people, it really makes a huge difference if there is a general increase in wealth. Second is that the system of division of labor was irreversible. If the society had tried to return to a system of autarky, with each household supplying all its own needs, the result would not have been impoverishment, but actual starvation. The reason is that division of labor is an increasing returns to scale. Four people can produce more than twice as much as two people. Four people can produce more than twice as much as two people. But then that means that once we get to eight, 16, 32 people, if we try to go back to a system that doesn't have increasing returns to scale, the system will collapse. So Plato in the, the Republic said, has Socrates say, a state arises, as I conceive, out of the needs of mankind. No one is self-sufficing. We all have many wants. So as we have many wants, many persons are needed to supply them. One takes a helper for one purpose, another for another. When these partners and helpers are gathered together in one habitation, the body of inhabitants is termed a state. And they exchange with one another, and one gives and another receives, that the exchange will be for their good. So exchange is mutually beneficial, but it takes division of labor to create wealth. So Plato's state was just a city. Now, it may be true that Athens depended on division of labor, but having a large group of unorganized people does not automatically cause division of labor. That requires markets. Adam Smith, in the title to chapter three of book one of The Wealth of Nations, says, division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. Division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. So if you have a market that's twice as big, you can get four times as much output. That concept is so simple that it's actually rarely taught in economics. But the, the losing sight of that fact means that we forget the actual argument for commercial society. So division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. And 
elaborating division of labor is what markets can do because markets are a set of institutions for reducing the transaction cost of impersonal exchange. So as Smith said, this great increase of the quantity of work, which in consequence of division of labor, the same number of people are capable of performing, actually refers back to the theory of moral sentiments. And I think it's important in terms of history of thought to recognize that Smith's contribution in the theory of moral sentiments is actually what makes him want to write The Wealth of Nations. So in section one of Theory of Moral Sentiments, Smith says, when we approve of any character or action, the sentiments which we feel are according to the foregoing system derived from four sources. So there's four sources of moral sentiments. First, we sympathize with the motives of the agent. We see someone act and we either think, oh, that's nice or, oh, that's horrible. Secondly, we enter into the gratitude of those who receive the benefit of his action. So if someone is grateful, we, the, our, our feeling of sympathy is compounded. Someone's acted well, the person acted on was grateful, that's terrific. That makes us happy also. Thirdly, we observe that his conduct has been agreeable to the general rules by which those two sympathies generally act. Well, suppose that a, a prisoner is taken before a judge, the prisoner has uh, allegedly committed murder, there's good evidence that the murder was committed, but the judge says, you know, I feel really bad for you, I'm just going to let you go. Well, the act was an act of charity, I'm feeling good for this person. The prisoner feels great, very grateful for having been released, but it violates the general rules by which we judge these kinds of actions. That's not the way that a judge gets to act. It shouldn't be guided by charity, but rather by justice. So sometimes our sense of justice may limit the extent to which we enter into these sympathies. But then, last of all, when we consider such actions as making part of a system of behavior which tends to promote the happiness either of the individual or the society, they appear to derive a beauty from this utility, not unlike that which we ascribe to any well-contrived machine. So Smith is arguing that our moral sentiments come from the, for the most part from the sympathies that we have from imaginatively entering into the position of other people. But we also appreciate systems that work well, like any well-contrived machine. Theory of Moral Sentiments was published in 1759. There was a later edition in the 1760s. But in the meantime, Adam Smith was kind of troubled by the fact that the need to explain the fourth of these sources of moral sentiments, that is, the social system that works like a well-contrived machine, he came to the idea that what made that system work like a well-contrived machine was division of labor. And he wrote an entire book about it. So you need to understand that the wealth of nations is devoted to explaining this fourth source because he felt that many people did not understand the importance of division of labor. So wealth of nations should be understood as a manual for understanding the importance of division of labor and for managing society in such a way as to foster the increase of division of labor because that's where what Adam Smith called opulence or prosperity comes from. So after Smith wrote Wealth of Nations, he went back and worked more on theory of moral sentiments, the, the year of his death. So there were six editions of theory of moral sentiments. He didn't do multiple editions of Wealth of Nations because it is, uh, it is explaining just that fourth source. However, Wealth of Nations is often admired because Smith was trying to elaborate a process that we would now call an emergent complex system. Now, Smith did not have uh, the tools to be able to know what emergent complex systems are. If you look at the International Encyclopedia of Philosophy, the claim is that emergent entities are or processes are those that are composed of constituent parts but are not reducible to those parts. So a, pro the, a property of a system is emergent if two things are true. First, the property is a novel aspect of the system that arises only when that system or entity has reached a certain level of complexity and mutual dependence. Second, the property exists only insofar as the system exists. It is distinct from the properties of the parts of the system from which it emerges. So 
the, the most commonly used example is life. Life is an emergent property of chemistry. But if I give you all the chemicals that make up a human being, or even just a paramecium, you could not construct life. Something else is required. So a market system with supply chains is the emergent consequence of the elaboration of division of labor from people pursuing voluntary exchanges through the institutions of markets. Those are emergent. It's very difficult to mimic those with a centrally planned system. So the problem is that it, we see all these functions going on around us, but market systems are emergent. And Smith many times throughout Wealth of Nations sort of gropes for this language, and it's not surprising. It wasn't available to him in 1776, but it's clearly where he was going for. So the, the problem is that centrally planned systems are not emergent. They're imposed from the top down. And there's not enough information about the private wants of individuals or the emergent things that we get uh, that, that come about as a result of supply chains. So the hardest part to explain is this. If each of us pursues our own self-interest in becoming more specialized and further elaborating the division of labor, we actually become more dependent on others doing the same thing for all of the products that we need without being explicitly told to do so. The result of this complex and unplanned mutual dependence is the entire system becomes wealthier and wealthier because productive processes realize increasing returns to scale. Now, the reason this is hard to explain is that it seems like you would say, well, what if some of the things that I, that I want are not being produced by the market? That, if you believe that, that means that there are profit opportunities that are obvious, that is someone could invest in a bunch of voluntary contracts using capital to buy inputs and combine them into things that people want and then sell them at a price that's higher than the cost of production, but they're not doing that. Now, under some circumstances, that's probably true. Entrepreneurs think of new products all the time, but people are constantly casting about to try to think of new ways to serve other people. And that's the remarkable thing is that there's a moral aspect to this. Entrepreneurs are constantly trying to think of new ways to serve consumers. Consumers may not even be aware of their efforts. They only become aware of it if it works. But that means that there's a constant attempt to produce profits, which makes the system wealthier. Now, I should say at this point, one of my favorite economics jokes um, and the, my ending to it is a little bit different. If you've heard the joke, my ending to it may be a little bit different from the one that you've heard before. But an economist and a stockbroker are walking along a street. Up ahead of them, they see a $100 bill lying on the sidewalk. The stockbroker says, well, we both saw the $100 bill. Uh, we'll split it. And the economist says, well, no, that's impossible. There can't possibly be a $100 bill on the sidewalk in equilibrium. Somebody would have picked it up. Stockholder says, well, OK. The, the stock broker says, well, okay, picks up the $100 bill and puts it in his pocket. And the economist says, see, see, there's no $100 bill. Well, both parts of that story are actually important. Both of them are correct. Entrepreneurs, and I, I use stock broker because it's, it's more obvious, but entrepreneurs are constantly going around looking for $100 bills and they find them. $100 bills are lying around everywhere but they're constantly looking for them and picking them up. As a result, it's pretty hard to find any $100 bills. So that's the, the, the system of capitalism means that people are constantly looking for $100 bills. And given that exchanges have to be voluntary, the only way I can find a $100 bill is if I can find a new way to serve you that makes you better off. But I'm doing that only for my own self-interest. So... Smith was sympathetic to the intuition that most of us share that it's better for those first three sources of, of observing other people's moral sentiments to have close personal relationships and trade based on private knowledge and trust. The problem is those things don't function well at scale. So the three things that we talked about, I respond to the motivation that I attribute to the actor, I respond to the gratitude or ingratitude of the person acting upon. And I have an overall cultural notion of what's right and wrong in that sort of setting. 
All of those things affect how I feel about your actions, but those things cannot function at scale. And remember, scale is what division of labor wants and needs. Division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. Division of labor is what causes opulence. So that fourth cause, the utility of the unfettered scope of commercial activity, ultimately suggests the necessity of rethinking systems of propriety based only on the first three sources of moral sentiments without suggesting that those sources were ultimately inferior. So we've been hearing recently uh, from the Biden administration, and I don't mean to pick on the Biden administration, just happens to be president. This always happens in politics. But the Biden administration is upset about what they see as price gouging. And in fact, they're going to form a national price gouging police. Well, what they're calling price gouging is just the result of two things. One is the increased relative scarcity of quite a few resources. And the second is inflation that's due to the monetary and fiscal policy that we've seen since 2016, both of which were very inflationary. So the result is that prices are going up. It, that doesn't have to mean it's price gouging, but we have a sense that it's wrong for people to raise prices and gouge. We don't really understand unless someone explains it at some length. We don't have a visceral moral reaction to the idea that prices are a mechanism for communicating the relative scarcity of resources. Smith is trying to explain that last thing that the price system is actually a well-contrived machine for communicating the relative scarcity of resources, dynamically updated in real time. That's extremely valuable. But mostly what I see is, well, this person's charging a really high price for cookies, or as the Biden administration has said recently, what they've done is they've reduced the size of cookies. And so cookie packages have gotten smaller and their people are just doing this for gouging, it should be illegal. So we have the sense that many perfectly normal market processes should be illegal because it violates some of the first three sources of moral sentiments. Smith tried, and we're still trying, to explain how that fourth source of moral sentiments, which is the well-contrived machine, the market process that delivers prices that tells us about relative scarcity, why that is not immoral and is in fact useful and should be admired. So Smith lays out his theory of division of labor at the very outset of the wealth of nations. So the first sentence is, the greatest improvement in the productive powers of labor and the greater part of skill, dexterity, and judgment with, with which it is anywhere directed or applied seems to have been effect, the effects of the division of labor. So then he gives the essential definition. And I'm going to go through the three parts of it. I have underlined the important parts on the following slide. So this great increase of the quantity of work, which in consequence of the division of labor, the same number of people are capable of performing owing to three different circumstances. First, to the increase in dexterity in every particular workman. So what that means is that I get better by practicing. If you and I are clones, but I practice making shoes and you practice cooking, within a year, we'll be quite different, even if we started out the same, because practice makes us better and more productive. Labor is not homogeneous. An experienced worker is more dexterous, but the required experience is actually determined by the division of labor. It's not experience working, it's experience doing this specific thing. And further, if we break up the work into smaller parts, the increase in productivity through dexterity is multiplied. Anytime I'm doing multiple things, I'm not learning as much of an increase in dexterity. So if we have a production line and I'm just doing the same thing, what I'm doing is connecting the sole of the shoe to the last, to the upper part of the shoe. I'll get really good at that. So I'll have a bigger increase in dexterity because we have more division of labor. So even a very dexterous artisan could realize the productivity gains captured by breaking the work up into four, or in the case of Adam Smith's pin factory example, 18 separate smaller steps. So each of the four activities might be a job in the small shop, and each of the 18 separate activities would be a job in a larger factory. 
the nature of jobs themselves and what dexterity means comes to depend on the extent of the market. And so I ask students when I teach my introduction to capitalism class here at Duke, why did Adam Smith have 18 separate steps in the pin factory? Is there something inherent to pin making? No, there were 18 separate steps because that level of separation produced a number of pins that satisfied the market for pins that was there was available given the costs of shipping pins to other countries on slow moving wooden uh, sailing ships. Now, the number of steps, if you count machines to make pins, there's, there's two factories in China that make almost all of the pins in the world. The costs of shipping are so much smaller that the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market, but the earth, the globe is the extent of the market. So as a result, we have very few people who are actually engaged in making pins in terms of the, the global market, but each of them is extremely productive because each of them is doing just very one, one very small step. So the increase in dexterity is greater, the smaller the scope of the job, but that requires a bigger market. Division of labor wants to be global. Second, to the saving of time, which is commonly lost in passing from one species to, of work to another. So he says that even if a person is working energetically, uh, when you switch from one task to another, he commonly saunters a little. So this anticipates the Taylorism, the time and motion studies, that you can get more work done if you can move more efficiently. But if you're switching between jobs, then you're always going to waste some time just in switching. And lastly, third, to the invention of a great number of machines which facilitate and abridge labor and which enable one man to do the work of many. So tool use, I can design tools. And over time, I may be able to design large machines that do uh, uh, the task of many very quickly. So it is true that because tool use has progressed so rapidly, we have far fewer people working in many industries, but that's because they're so much more productive because of tool use. So those three things, increases in dexterity, the, re the increase in efficiency because of a reduction in the need to switch between jobs and better tool use are the, the reasons why division of labor exhibits increasing returns to scale. So Smith formulated that system saying that there is no role for division of labor or decentralized commercial processes until we come to the system of behavior which tends to promote the happiness of the entire society. The beauty from this utility, not unlike that which we ascribe to any well-contrived machine, derives from the emergent processes in commerce. People are not doing this on purpose. They're not saying, I want to create wealth for everyone. What they're trying to do is pursue profits. But pursuing profits requires you to try to find larger and larger markets and engage more in division of labor. So an example from my friend, the, the, the now late Walter Williams. <clears throat> now, y'all are in Philadelphia, uh, but this, so this works for more, most Northeastern cities. I used to live in Texas, and if I would mention New York City, people would usually hoot and mock me. Many people in Texas are not really fans of New York City. And even if they are, the degree of their benevolence may not be very large. That is, their willingness to help the people of New York is limited. Same with people who live in Idaho. Idaho is a rather isolated state, and they think of New York City as being something quite far away. They may have some impulses to help people in New York City. Now, New York City is a large city. Let's suppose that people in New York City really like steak and potatoes. Now, they may like other things, but for the sake of argument, let's say they like steak and potatoes. Is Idaho going to send people in New York potatoes out of benevolence? Are people in Texas going to send beef to New York out of benevolence? Well, maybe they'll send some, but they won't send enough. 
And so Adam Smith's example of it is not from the benevolence of the baker or the butcher or the potato grower, we could say, but rather from their self-interest. So people in Idaho grow potatoes because they know that they can sell at a price that is greater than their costs, these potatoes to people in New York who value the potatoes more than the cost. And so there's a mutually beneficial exchange that takes place. They're both made better off. People in Texas know that they can grow beef at a price less than people in New York are eager to pay. And so a lot of steak and potatoes go from Idaho and Texas to New York, more than you would get if you just depended on benevolence. So the point is that Smith is not saying there is no benevolence. Smith values benevolence. What he's saying is that benevolence alone would not be sufficient to operate at scale. And I keep coming back to scale, but that's the essential feature of capitalism. By operating at scale, capitalism allows the elaboration of division of labor. And that's where all increases in wealth and prosperity come from. That's where the widely shared part of wealth and prosperity come from. So Smith, sometimes it's said that there's two Adam Smiths, and this is not really accurate, I think. Uh, Smith, in The Theory of Moral Sentiment, said, how selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. But that's not enough to supply a big city like New York that's far away and impersonal with enough resources. So in The Wealth of Nations, Smith says, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. This division of labor is not originally the effect of any human wisdom, which foresees and intends that general opulence to which it gives occasion. It is the necessary, though very slow and gradual, consequence of a certain propensity in human nature which has in view no such extensive utility, the propensity to truck, barter, and exchange one thing for another. But Smith is claiming the fact that there is this propensity to truck, barter, and exchange results in the elaboration of emergent, unintended supply chains that once they exist, now have a property that's different than just buying things if I'm exchanging them at the local market. So the, the emergent process of creating supply chains means that we have a, an infrastructure for delivering huge amounts of resources to large cities that need them and could not very well do without them if those supply chains were to collapse as we saw in the, the recent uh, follow-up to, to COVID. So on its face, the pursuit of profit and the elaboration of division of labor does not automatically satisfy the sense of propriety developed in the context of personal relationships. Smith actually concedes that. His great achievement in combining the systems was to explain that our notions of propriety should be expanded to encompass commerce and the pursuit of honest profit. We should morally approve the pursuit of honest profit. We should give moral authorization to people going out and acting in their self-interest and to uh, obtain profits. Now, the reason that this is important is that if we look at the share of the world population living in extreme poverty from 1820 to 2015, we can see more about how division of labor the elaboration of division of labor has increased prosperity. Now, this the definition of extreme poverty is the number of people who are living on less than $2.10 a day using purchasing power parity. So we're comparing over time, not just constant dollars, but also the buying power across countries. Now, you could argue that this comparison doesn't make any sense. Um, after all, in 1820, people were not able to buy cell phones or microwaves or electric cars. Well, when you think about that, that actually makes the argument in favor of commerce even stronger, because maybe I need more money now in order to be able to buy all the new things that have been created as a result. 
But if we're talking about just being able to buy the things that I need in order to survive, 94% of the human population in 1820 lived below $2.10 a day. And that's accounting for the fact that there's all this other stuff they weren't able to buy. They couldn't buy food and shelter. So the most of the human population in 1820, far and away, lived in extreme poverty. Fell a little bit by 1900, started to fall rapidly after 1950. And since 1950, we've gone from 72% to quite a bit less than 10%. Uh, in, in terms of the, the percent of the world population living in extreme poverty. That increase in prosperity is a result of market processes and the elaboration of division of labor. Not all of it is capitalism by any means, but market processes generally, the two countries in which there has been the greatest number of people who have uh, been removed from poverty is China and India. And much of that has happened since 1970. Now, the same period, 1820 uh, to 2015, if we look at this graph, it's a hockey stick. You don't always encounter hockey sticks when it comes to arguments in favor of capitalism, but this is a hockey stick argument. So the red is the number of people living in extreme poverty. And I should say for a moment, that's important. It's not the percentage. It's not the percentage of people living in extreme poverty. It's the number of people who lived in extreme poverty. And we've had a big increase in population. So you'll notice that about 1960, 1965, we see a peak in the number of people, who, the number of people who are living in extreme poverty. Since 1965, the number of people living in extreme poverty has fallen. The number of people not in extreme poverty has shot through the roof. So the percentage of people living in extreme poverty has really fallen dramatically. More and more people, and this the definition here is a dollar ninety international per day. It's not much different if you use two ten. <clears throat> so it, it it is controlled for purchasing power parity again. The thing about the, the, the interesting thing about this graph is that it demonstrates the enormous increase in the number of people on earth because the, the increase of the reddish orange and green is the total population of the earth, which means we've gone from 1 billion to more than 7 billion people. And that illustrates the, ir the irreversibility part so it could be, you might expect that the population of the earth has gone up because of division of labor, but the quality of life for people has gone down. So maybe we, you know, you go from a hundred people to a thousand people, but average income falls. That's not happening. We've gone from 1 billion to 7 billion and average income has skyrocketed. So we've both been able to support a larger population and we've had an increase in the wealth of those individuals on average. The number of people living in extreme poverty has actually fallen. And that may surprise you. I think a fair number of people think, well, the number of poor is constantly increasing. It's gone down, and by a lot. Now, you could say, well, it takes more to live than it did in 1820. That's not actually true. Infant mortality rate has fallen. Lifespans have increased. Yes, if you are talking about what is required to have a cell phone, a car, and a microwave, that costs more than it did because in 1820, those things weren't available. But most people actually can afford those things now. So if we break this out by major world regions, um, this is GDP per capita since the beginning of time, well, since uh, the beginning of the current era, this comes from uh, Angus Madison's 2007 book. And the, again, you see a hockey stick somewhere around 1950, somewhere around the end of the Second World War. And before that, there, there was very little growth. This is not that it's just constant. So the increase, and at an increasing rate, has happened within the lifetimes of people that are alive today, and certainly within the lifetimes of my parents, for example, my dad was born in 1919. So the big increase 
in GDP per capita, this is 1990 GDP per capita, the increase in the US, in Western Europe, Latin America, China, former USSR. It is true that Africa and in India have lagged behind, and the, it is interesting to think about the reasons for that. A big part of it is that for whatever reason, they've been unable to take advantage of the elaboration of the division of labor. So some takeaways, and I will conclude. Commerce, which allows the emergent expansion of division of labor, has enriched and improved the lives of billions. And it is easy to look at the failures or problems that have occurred as a result. Um, one thing that I think people are starting to recognize is that the population, uh, we, we used to be worried a lot in the 1960s and 70s, we were worried a lot about uh, excessive human population. But it appears that somewhere between 2030 and 2040, the human population will hit a maximum and after that will start to fall. A big part of the reason for that is wealth. It turns out, and this is sometimes called the Kuznets curve, as, as a nation becomes wealthier, for a variety of reasons, but some of them have to do with the opportunity cost of women and the fact that of women's time and the fact that women have become educated, uh, birth rates go down, partly because women are now capable of living independently and partly because their time is more valuable. So the, the, the prosperity has solved the population problem, except for the countries that are still poor which is an interesting recommendation then. The big problem with India and Africa is not that their populations are growing too fast, it's that their economies are not growing fast enough. If they could, if India and Africa could do a better job of securing property rights and encouraging the development of commercial society, the population problem would solve itself. There's a second example of the Kuznets curve and Kuznets is K-U-Z-N-E-T-S. Um, the second example is called the environmental Kuznets curve. As nations reach higher and higher levels of income because of the elaboration of division of labor, they produce less uh, carbon and other pollutants per capita. They become environmentally cleaner. The United States has become much environmentally cleaner since 2000 as it becomes more wealthy. Now, we still, the United States still produces an enormous amount of pollutants, but at the margin, a way to get countries to perform better environmentally is to make them more prosperous. And as prosperity increases, the problem of pollution, like the problem of population, will at least start to solve itself. Second, many of the people now on earth would not be alive if not for the extension of division of labor through commerce. So I had said a couple of times it was irreversible. There are a number of people that say we need a smaller population. The way that we should do that is to reduce consumption. And that means maybe we could reduce division of labor. Um, in one of the uh, comic movies, Thanos had the idea, it was the Avengers, uh, Thanos, the bad guy, wanted to reduce the population of the universe. He wanted half the people to disappear. And when he got the Infinity Stones, he was able to do that. There's a movement now that basically holds that people are damaging to the environment. I tend to think that human beings are assets. And the more humans we have, within reason and under circumstances where that it's sustainable, but the more people we have, the more we'll, we'll see an increase in division of labor and an increase in prosperity, which gives us the resources to address problems of the environment. In any case, we can't go back without mass starvation. We can't cut back on division of labor because only through division of labor do we have enough resources to provide for the people who are already on earth. Third, a person working at a minimum wage job in the US stands above the 90th percentile of the world income distribution. So we often talk about income inequality in the US. If you look at in income inequality in the world, a minimum wage job in the US means you're in the top 10% of the world income distribution. 
Now, maybe you can say we're an advanced country, that's not good enough. But the fact is that in terms of historical wealth, a minimum wage job in the United States puts you right at the pinnacle of the wealthiest people in history. And that is a result of the elaboration of division of labor in a capitalist system. Finally, I often ask my students, uh, how many people do you think have are employed at the minimum wage? And I'll start out at 30%, see how many raise their hands. It's actually less than 2%. Fewer than 2% of Americans who have jobs are employed at the minimum wage. Now, there, there may be a lot of people who don't have jobs. That's a different question. But very few people are actually employed at the minimum wage. What that means is that most people are employed at uh, uh, salaries that are quite a bit above the minimum wage. And I want to ask you a question. Why? Why would any company pay more than the minimum wage? And the answer is almost all job contracts are based on voluntary exchange. That is, I only can get you to work if that is your best alternative for working. Now, there are some people, about 2%, who have so few other job opportunities that they have to work at the minimum wage. But more than 98% of Americans have salary offers that are above, and many, of course, well above the minimum wage, not because their employer loves them, but because a voluntary system of employment allows us to take advantage of the fact that we have to both consent to a contract before it starts to operate. So none of this is to say that the rule of the state is non-existent. So the, I don't want you to think that markets are what happen when the state does nothing. But the primary role of the state in the system that I have talked about is to act as a neutral referee rather than an active participant. And there are a number of people who have made the argument that the, the decline in the rate of growth that we've seen in the US in past decades has something to do at least with the increase of the conception of the state as doing something beyond being a neutral referee and trying to manage prices, industrial structure, antitrust in ways that distort the information that is produced by market processes. So the argument about the role of the state is important, and you're, you're going to hear quite a bit about, of it, about it in future lectures. But the fact that the role of the state is important doesn't mean that it needs to be broad or constantly expanding. Well, that is my talk. Let me stop sharing, and I am happy to entertain questions. Thank you, Dr. Munger. So you are free to uh, make questions. We have a couple already. So let me ask, uh, on the environmental Kuznets curve, is it possible that at the national level, a nation will decrease its level of domestic pollutants as income rises by outsourcing production to other countries? Therefore, we may see national Kuznets curves, but we could never see a global Kuznets curve. I'm with you until the last part. It is certainly true that if there are broad disparities of income, then a wealthy country may pay a poor country to do more heavily polluting activities. But remember, my claim was what we have to do is increase the prosperity of the poorest countries. If we get rid of the international differences in prosperity, then yes, the Kuznets curve could have the effect of, so both, both of those things could be true. That is that wealthy nations are outsourcing their pollution, although that until recently was not such, such an important thing. Um, but it, as the prosperity of poorer countries increases, then there is a global Kuznets curve because those countries that were poor but now are now wealthy will not be willing to accept heavily polluting activities. So the, the, I, I see your point, and that, that probably has been part of what's happened in the past. But as we're seeing increases in post prosperity now among poor nations, there is a global Kuznets curve, and things are getting better, although not quickly enough. Second question, does the phrase the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market has the implication that there is no division of the labor outside of the market? No. 
um, and it is it is a fair question. Um, so there were there there were a number of writers who have noted that socialism likewise is capable of elaborating division of labor, and in fact. Um, the objective of much of a socialist plan system is to create division of labor. So you will be assigned to this job, you'll be assigned to this job early on, we'll see what your talents are. The question is, which of those two systems operates better? And there really aren't any examples of socialist systems operating at scale. So the, the Soviet Union for a while made quite a bit of rapid progress up to a certain point. But beyond that, the Soviet Union has had trouble. China switched to a market system. They stopped using a socialist system. Uh, the countries of Northern Europe, uh, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, all switched away from socialist elaboration of division of labor and became uh, robustly capitalist in the 1990s. So it is certainly true that socialism also can... Um, elaborate division of labor. And in fact, in my book, what I suggested was it would be more accurate to say division of labor is limited by the extent of the cooperation horizon. Because the, the questioner is right. Market means that it sounds like it's only for commercial society. The, the size of the cooperation horizon would mean that if we're a socialist country, and we can cooperate with other socialist countries, maybe we can expand the division of labor, we can still exchange things, that's entirely possible. It's just that empirically, there aren't any examples of that having worked at least so far. Thank you. Uh, third question, does division of labor by increasing our interdependency may also make us more vulnerable to shocks that are outside of our control? Absolutely, and we saw the problems with that. Um, to the extent that the we are dependent on a single source, and if production processes are dependent on fragile just-in-time delivery, and I the the that means that many production processes may have single source points of failure. That if if I don't get this product at this time as an input, my entire production process has to shut down. Uh, it makes us very fragile. That sort of dependency is potentially a problem. And as, as a result, um, I think a lot of people have kind of rethought the extent to which that was true. However, for most, for that, that is the claim about division of labor being desirable. However, if you look more closely, the systems where there's an active market in producing those inputs actually perform better in difficult times. If the United States tried to produce everything itself, we'd be poor. We actually have to depend on outsiders. Every firm faces what's called a make or buy decision. The firm does not grow the wheat that they use to make the bread in the employee cafeteria. We buy that from someone. So nations face make or buy decisions also. It is a legitimate question to say now for national security, maybe for chips, for example, we have to have a domestic source of chip manufacturer. We can't depend on Taiwan because uh, China might attack and then where would we be? So the, the, it makes sense to have some sort of balance between those two. The, the question is well taken, but the not having dependency would create a really big decline in prosperity, but it, it is a wake up call. We should think about the fragility of long international supply chains. What effects are to be expected to occur in terms of division of labor if population, global population decreases as it expected to occur in the world in the coming decades? That's, that's a great question and I wish I knew more about the answer. Um, as we have seen increases in productivity it may very well be, well, um, John Maynard Keynes wrote about the fact that maybe there'll be a two-day work week. That as we, we see these increases in productivity, we have solved, he, he claimed, we have solved the economic problem. And there's no longer scarcity and we can all have enough. Uh, Tyler Cowen and others have pointed out that there's a strange 
thing that happens, it seems like the wealthier people become, the more they work. And it might be that the opportunity cost of their time grows up. That is, if I have a really high salary, I don't want to have a two-day work week. If the number of people starts to fall, two things will happen. One is there will be labor shortages. The other is there'll be fewer people to consume stuff. And the question is, which of those two will dominate? And I don't know the answer. But labor shortages, we're actually already seeing. The United States, because we're getting successively smaller increments, that is the, the number of people being born 15, 20 years ago is smaller, we're actually seeing labor shortages, even though the U.S. has pretty robust immigration. There's a lot of countries in Europe, and Japan is a basket case. They're, they're already seeing rapid population decline. It's not clear what the effect on the economy is going to be because labor shortages mean wages go up, but a shortage of consumers to sell things mean that prices go down. It's not clear which will dominate. Alice Shang, who says that she met you briefly while at GMU, asks about China. She says that uh, based on what you talk about China, that says that market behavior there is based on savings rather than the credit market. She wonders what will be the difference in those two systems in terms of advantages and disadvantages, and how will China continue to grow with the current system? I think China's in trouble. I have written some things about this, and of course, I hope I'm wrong, but I think China's in desperate trouble because China is unable to deliver on the promises of increased growth and prosperity. So for a long time, if you lived in a village in China and you got a motorcycle and some electricity, and uh, so a washing machine, a microwave, that's fine. They can do what they want. The government can do what it wants. But then we bought an apartment in Shanghai and only had the one kid because the government said we can only have one child. And that one child was sent to university. And now that one child is looking for, all right, where is my job? Where is my apartment in Shanghai? How am I going to be better off than my parents? And the growth rate in China has fallen because they're not increasing their capital stock enough to continue to increase wages. So the result is they're, they're under pressure. They're capital constrained. They, they wasted a lot of their capital on housing and factories that are now not going to be used. The result is that I think China may start to have political problems because they're failing to deliver on their economic promise. Um, and it, it's not clear what the reaction of the increasingly autocratic government of China is going to be since Xi uh, changed the constitution and just announced that he would basically be president forever. I wouldn't be surprised if China is going to become a hereditary monarchy well, where he will name his successor um, it, it, it could become like North Korea, where it is a very autocratic, narrowly focused, inwardly focused nation um, that's not delivering on the promises that it seemed to have 10 years ago because of expansion of commercial society. And the reason is the government has not been willing to give up the control that they would have to sacrifice if they're actually going to be a capitalist society, because then capital is being raised by private investors, and that would mean private ownership. The Chinese government has relied on leases uh, where they still control the asset rather than on private ownership in the corporate form. One last question about the history of ideas. It says, how does the historical context shape the popularity of some ideas? Why did Adam Smith's view became popular in Britain, especially? Adam Smith's claim was about the sources and consequences of development of wealth. And England, because it is an island nation, England and the Netherlands were the two nations that were most interested in expanding trade. And so since Smith was saying the more trade, the better, there were a number of economic interests that said, yes, that's right, and supported him. And so uh, public choice people call this a Baptist and bootleggers coalition. You need someone to provide the intellectual argument and then an economic interest to support it. 
So the reason that England and Netherlands uh, adopted Adam Smith's program was that it benefited a lot of the shipping and financial interests in those two countries. The advantage was that it also turned out to be correct. And so that meant that it then spread to other places. But I, I think you can identify in terms of history of ideas, the things that become useful are those that have some powerful supporter. One of the reasons that Marx, Karl Marx became important, uh, people weren't really, really reading Marx that much um, until 1914, 1915, a number of revolutionaries in Russia were looking for an intellectual program, and then they used that to motivate what they wanted to accomplish anyway, which was the takeover of the Russian state. So it was a combination of an intellectual program combined with a set of interests that said, we will use this to our advantage. So the, it's a good question about the kind of history of ideas it always requires someone to be interested in the elaboration of that idea, maybe for their own self-interest or at least for their own purposes. And I think that's a big part of the reason why Smith was in the right place at the right time. Uh, England as an island nation with shipping and financial industries, there were people who were looking for some sort of justification. Well, thank you, Dr. Munger. Uh, we have reached the end of the session. And everybody, well, we will continue next week talking our second part of the, of the course, talking more about the morality of markets by lecture by me and by philosopher Jason Brennan from Georgetown University. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. Thanks so much for having me.